Hey everybody. So I hope this goes well, knock on wood, like. <laughs> okay, let's get down to business. So, the classics. The classics, the classics, the classics. Who in this day and age hasn't at least heard of Romeo and Juliet? Nobody, yeah, that's exactly what I thought. Um, it's practically a given in this day and age that Hamlet is one of the most important literary figures in all of history. And because of that, a lot of people forget to really look at him and discover for themselves why that is. Um, during my freshman year, we read Romeo and Juliet as is the standard. You know, we went through it in class, we analyzed the text, et cetera, et cetera, you know, the usual. Um, while I didn't have any troubles with that, something seemed a little off to me. And then we watched Zeffirelli's 1968 Romeo and Juliet and everything came into the light. Actors know that plays are meant to be performed. And I mean, I understood that to an extent, but the difference between reading the script and seeing those actors bring life to characters that I'd heard about was monumental. Romeo and Juliet didn't have faces in my mind before we watched the film, uh, but then Leonard Whitting and Olivia Hussey offered themselves as mediums for Shakespeare's word to come to life, and the characters relished in it. The characters' choices were more accessible for me to absorb as an actor and an audience member because it's the actor's job and not the text to bring the characters to life and lay their lives on the line. Since then, I've made it a habit of going through scripts out loud just because it's easier for me to understand, and because of that, I'm going to perform a couple monologues for you guys before I leave. Because, you know, that's really how Shakespeare intended his work to be presented as art in front of an audience. Well, when I was about five years old, my grandmother took me to see The Lion King on Broadway, and I got swept up in all of that. Um, I spent the entire summer vainly trying to recreate those magical moments um, with, let's see, a crude CD recording, my younger neighbors who were about four and five as the rest of my cast, and myself playing every lead role in the basement of my house. Um, I distinctly remember holding up my Nala souvenir doll while the rest of the kids ran around me in really confused circles as I played, you know, the circle of life in the background on repeat for three hours. <laughs> to say the least, um, that didn't really sate my hunger for the theater. And when I stumbled across Shakespeare in my middle school years, I immediately fell in love, as Miranda did in The Tempest when she laid her eyes on Ferdinand. They were caught up as permanently as I was with acting. Miranda shows her passion in this outburst to Ferdinand and proves that love at first sight can even exist in the middle of the sea. One of my sex no woman's face remembered, save from my glass mine own. Nor have I seen more than what I may call men than you, good friend, and my dear father. How features are abroad I am skillless of, but by my modesty, the jewel in my dower. I would not wish any companion in the world but you. Nor can imagination form a shape besides yourself to like of. But I prattle something too wildly, and my father's precepts I therein to forget. As an interpretation of a historical figure, um, Joan of Arc in Shakespeare's Henry VI, Part One, yeah, it's a long one, stands as proof to this young girl's strength to speak her mind in a world dominated by men. This has always been an inspiration to me as a female actress to trust in myself and stand up for my artistic beliefs. An actor's instincts on stage is one of their strongest assets. And if they don't believe in themselves, they'll ignore their impulse, and that, and that is one of the biggest mistakes you can make. Joan is an inspiration for me to avoid this, as she succeeds in using her instincts to shift gears in navigating the world around her. Uh, in this monologue, Joan uses her impulses to persuade Burgundy to return to his people, the French, and betray the English, who he sided with the majority of the war. Look on thy country, look on fertile France, and see the cities and the towns defaced by wasting ruin of the cruel foe. See, 
See the pining malady of France. Behold the wounds, the most unnatural wounds, which thou thyself hast given her woeful breast. O turn thy edge sword another way. Strike those that hurt, and hurt not those that help. One drop of blood drawn from my country's bosom should grieve thee more than streams of foreign gore. Return thee, therefore, with a flood of tears, and wash away thy country's stained spots. When Talbot hath set footing once in France, and fashioned thee that instrument of ill, who then but English Henry will be lord? And thou thyself be thrust out like a fugitive. See then that thou fightest against thy countrymen, and joinst with them will be thy slaughtermen. Come. Come. Return thou wandering lord. Charles and the rest will take thee in their arms. Making big choices as an actor in the rehearsal process is something that I've been working on at the uh, North Carolina School of the Arts. Right now, I'm planning on doing that for hopefully the rest of my senior year and my life. As my teacher, Kelly Maxner, told me at the beginning of the year, it is the actor's job to present the most that they can for the director, who then navigates which choices are best for the overall aesthetic of the show. It's easier to tone down an actor who makes big choices for them to pick through than pulling an actor out of their shell. One of the biggest females in Shakespeare is, oh gosh, I'm gonna be cursed for saying this in the stage, but Lady Macbeth. Uh, known for her fiery attitude and stubbornness, Lady Macbeth always does as she wishes, you know, a unique female for Shakespeare's time. In this monologue, she's pressuring her husband to kill his ally, the king, in order to advance themselves socially. She lays down the law and never once hesitates to speak her mind. He is almost sucked. Why have you left the chamber? Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Has it slept since? And does it look now so freely at what it did, which is now green and pale? From this time such I account thy love. Art thou afeard to be the same in thine own act and valor as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou have that which thou esteemest the ornament of life, and live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon I would like the poor cat in the adage? What beast was then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man, and to be much more than what you were, you would be so much more the man nor time nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves, and their fitness now does unmake you. I have given suck, and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out, had I so sworn as you have done to this. <sighs> if we should fail, Screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail. When Duncan is asleep, or to the rather shall his day's hard journey soundly invite him, his two chamberlains will I with wine and wassail so convince that memory, the warder of the brain, shall be a fume, and the receipt of reason a limbic only. When in swinish sleep their drenched nature lies as in a death, what cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? What not put upon his spongy officers who shall bear the guilt of our great quell? And who shall dare receive it other, as we shall make our grief and clamor roar upon his death? A uh, stark contrast to Lady Macbeth. <laughs> Helena, from A Midsummer Night's Dream, is completely dependent on the man in her life, Demetrius, and will do anything to appease him. Yet, like many of Shakespeare's women, she still has a fighting spirit within her. In this scene, it seems as if her closest peers are playing a cruel trick on her, and she does not take to it kindly. Uh, Shakespeare is notorious for pushing the stakes of his characters to the limit, and this is definitely no exception. It's always life or death to them. And it's important for the actor to take note of that. Although Helena's life is never actually threatened, she states that death is one of the only solutions left to her. 
even though it's a bit extreme, um, she's completely serious, uh, which attests to her commitment. Likewise, commitment to the scenes that for an actor should always be automatic. Uh, acting ensembles succeed best with a base of trust in them. And in, in improv work, um, when an ensemble member doesn't try to be present on stage, they leave the rest of their actors hanging. The same idea applies to monologues with the actor's relationship to the characters and their surroundings. Have you not set Lysander, as in scorn, to follow me and, and praise my eyes and face and, and made your other love Demetrius, who even but now did spurn me with his foot to call me goddess, nymph, divine and rare, precious, celestial? Wherefore speaks he this to her he hates? And wherefore doth Lysander deny your love so rich within his soul, and tender me, forsooth affection, but by your setting on, by your consent. But though I be not so ungrace as you, so hung upon with love, so fortunate, but miserable most to love unloved, this you should pity rather than despise. I do persevere. Counterfeit, sad looks, make mouths upon me when I turn my back, wink at each other, hold the sweet jest up. This sport well carried shall be chronicled. If you had any pity, grace, or manners, you would not do me such an argument. But fare ye well, tis partly my own fault, which death or absence soon shall remedy. She gets a little over dramatic. <laughs> Although Helena never does follow through with that statement, um, Ophelia does. One of the most fragile creatures ever presented by Shakespeare, her entire world crashes around her when her love Hamlet pronounces her feelings to be nothing but a sham. Ophelia's grown to symbolize a tragic loss to me as she's always been heavily influenced by the men in her life and loses her personal identity and strength in the process. She can no longer take it when her father's wishes forbid her from being honest with Hamlet, and she tragically dies after losing grasp of her sanity, which starts to slip away from her in a fit of agony in this excerpt. Oh. The noble mind is here overthrown. The courtiers, soldier, scholar, I, tongue sword. The expectancy and the rose of the fair state, the glass of fashion and the mold of form. The observed of all observers. Quite, quite down. And I of ladies most deject and wretched that suck the honey of his music vows. Now see that noble and most sovereign reason, like sweet bells jangled out of tune and harsh, that unmatched form and feature of blown youth, blasted with ecstasy. Woe is me to have seen what I have seen, see what I see. Whew. <laughs> that doesn't get any better for her, to be honest. That's, it's just downhill from there. <laughs> um, from just the five women I've barely touched on in this presentation, Shakespeare shows that many different aspects of females in which we can appreciate his intricacies in writing with the real magic lies in the presentation of his work, a task given to grateful actors across the world. We're given the opportunity to breathe life into characters that would simply disappear if they were never presented in the way that Shakespeare had wanted. And that's not the end of it. What is a performer without their audience? The witnesses to his words are the most important piece of theater. Otherwise, the story made to be shared would be lost. Before I leave, I wanted to thank you all. Without you guys here, the art of theater would be missing as well. 
and I hope observing the experiences of Shakespeare's characters is as fulfilling to you as it is for the people it is hidden in his text. Who knows? Maybe you'll learn more about yourself as a person while you watch these characters discover themselves in the most unusual of situations. I know I did. Thank you. <laughs>